And this is, of course, the signs we talked about earlier that Matthew called the beginning of sorrows, the beginning of birth pangs. Wars, famines, pestilences, and so forth. They are not only detailed in Matthew and Luke, but they also seem to parallel the uh, same events in the book of Revelation chapter 6. But notice after verse 11, there's a very important phrase that we don't want to miss. Luke says something very strange here. After highlighting all these signs, he then says, But before all these, whoops, see that's just the opposite of what Matthew said. Matthew's, all his remarks were after those signs. Luke says, But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, and being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. So he's speaking here to the new believers in that first century. We had the beginning of sorrows, the false Christ, the wars, famines, pestilence, and earthquakes. And these were collectively labeled by Matthew the beginning of sorrows. But the end is not yet, he says. Both accounts, both Matthew and Luke, allude to this cosmic upheaval group. With the, the sun, the moon, the stars, and so forth. And there, in, in, uh, Matthew has it in, in uh, verses 12, 10 to 13. Luke has it in verse 25 and following. And Revelation, of course, deals with that uh, after, uh, d d downstream a bit. And uh, remember, when we, when we were talking about these things back in verse 11, great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, famines, pestilences, and fearful sights, and great signs shall be from heaven. Then we have this strange passage by Luke. But before all these, everything Luke's talked about is before these, these uh, uh, cosmic, these uh, beginning of sorrows. There's a different emphasis, at least, between where Luke says, but before all these, and, and uh, Matthew says just the opposite. All these are the beginning of sorrows, then shall they. What the dividing, the, 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 the watershed issue are the false Christ, wars, famines, and earthquakes. Luke clearly focuses his attention on that which occurs before those signs. Matthew clearly focuses virtually all his remarks on that occur after those. So they certainly have a different emphasis. One says before these things, and the other one says then shall they, or is another way of saying after these things. Same, same equivalent thought. In your patience possess ye your souls. When ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Okay, um, that, uh, that's uh, so far so good. Then let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. Let them which are in the midst of it depart out. Let not them that are in the countries enter there into. It's understandable why people would think that, gee, this is the same thing as Matthew, except it's not. Matthew's discussion about getting out was after the abomination of desolation. This is before that group of signs. It's a different desolation altogether. And not only are they get out of town, if you're not in town, for heaven's sakes, don't come in. That's what he's saying. For these are the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. So we're dealing here with the siege of Jerusalem, and we need to understand a little bit more what, what happened there. Vespasian and his son, obviously, were very prominent in the Roman uh, chain of command. Vespasian was commanded by Nero to attack Jerusalem. In fact, Judea in general, Jerusalem in particular. And so he and his son, Titus, attack the cities and the Galilee, and there's a whole campaign that's detailed for you in, by Josephus. He recorded it in great detail, how they're knocking off one city after another. They're not at Jerusalem yet, but they're making their way down to Ju Judea. Then a strange thing happens that we overlook. Nero dies, and the uh, maneuvering for the throne takes, goes on. First Galba takes over, then Otho, and then Vitellius, all for just a matter of months. Total turbulence in Rome. And what does Vespasian do? He goes to Rome, and he ends up taking over the entire empire, leaving his son Titus to fulfill what, uh, what they had started. So there's a, there is a hiatus there of more than a year that they're in place almost, but they haven't set up the siege yet. 
Titus is left to complete the siege, and you can find all this in Josephus, in the Wars of the Jews, book 6, chapter 6, verse 1 and following. So Titus actually sets up the siege. Now, here's the real point. Um, The... uh, Eusebius records in book 3, chapter 5, verse 1, that because of that hiatus in the siege where it wasn't sealed off yet, the Christians that took Jesus' advice got out. And according to Eusebius, Eusebius, they went to a town called Pella in the mountains uh, in Perea. That's over way way east of the the Jordan. And... uh, so it's interesting, there are, I always wondered where scholars get this fact that there were, there's about a million one hundred thousand that were slaughtered in the siege of Jerusalem, when Jerusalem fell. And yet I had several scholars, I came across this understanding by some, that there are no Christians that perished in that siege. Where did they get that? Well, I found out it's because they, uh, because of the record, records, Eusebius being one of them, and there's some others that indicate that they split, because the siege wasn't sealed off yet. They were, but it was clear that it was coming to anyone that was uh, sensitive. And Jesus told them, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, get out of town. And they did. And they succeeded because of that. And uh, you'll find that uh, 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 mentioned in a number of places in the Nicene and post-Nicene Fathers. Uh, Volume 1 has most of Eusebius' writings, and and I, I checked it out. But anyway, the advice continues for this first desolation. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. Now wait a minute, that's not what's going on in the Great Tribulation. They're just getting crunched. No, they're led, they're, they're, they're led away captive to all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now here we have a huge, huge uh, issue. First of all, it's clear, as you've been up till now then, that what Luke is focusing on is a desolation of Jerusalem that's before the beginning of sorrows and all those signs. What we have in front of us are two desolations of Jerusalem. One before all those signs, that's what Luke is talking about, that did happen in 70 AD. And a final great tribulation that occurs later. There's two different desolations in view here. uh, But Luke also says, Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles till the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. This has got a lot of people very excited. There was a lot of excitement when the state of Israel was reborn. Just as the Old Testament, can, can a nation be born in a day? It was. In May 14th of 1948. And there are many people that try to set dates. Gee, one generation from that, call it 40 years, that would be 1988. And we had all those books, and a guy by the name of Wise and Ant, uh, uh, you know, uh, was convinced that Christ was coming back because of that uh, understanding here. Well, when that didn't happen, so said, gee, maybe the real duration here is not the nation Israel, it is the city of Jerusalem. And in June of 1967, as a result of the Six-Day War, Jerusalem's now, for the first time in 2,000 years, under the Star of David. That's kind of exciting. So a lot of people are, are starting to count from there. Well, you say, gee, if, 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 if a generation is 38 years, and, and, and uh, if, that, if, if, if you say Jerusalem isn't trodden down by the Gentiles since June of 1967, you add 38 to 67, you get an interesting year. This one. <laughs> Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not suggesting that's correct. I'm just saying that's where some people are getting excited. Because one can validly argue Jerusalem is still trodden down by the Gentiles. It's still, we do not have Israel is unable to get the nations to put their embassies there. They call it their capital. It's under dispute. It's still, it's still uh, 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 contested. And that's why we watch that with great interest. But... Um, there's another issue that lurks behind this that's still uh, indeterminate. What is the trigger for that generation? I'll come back to that before we finish. Anyway, Luke continues, There shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and the stars, upon the earth, distress of nations, with perplexity the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. So Luke is looking ahead here. He's talked about the one signs. He's looking ahead at these, this cosmic upheaval. There's something interesting. It's not actually here. There's nothing about the tribulation. 
This is stuff that happens after the tribulation. It's as if he's looking, overlooking that, if you will. But I, this verse um, 26, when I was on the board of, uh, with Walter Martin, his ministry, he used to love to quote this verse, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for look, and he'd always gesture like this, and for looking after those things which are coming upon the earth. And he would gesture with like a flying saucer. So he was convinced that that was the UFO that we talk about. Men's hearts failing himself for fear, for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. And the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And uh, so he was, he was into that at that time. Yeah. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with, uh, with power and great glory. So that's very similar to the cosmic upheavals that uh, Matthew talks about. And then Luke goes on to say, when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Boy, now that's interesting. What does that mean? Well, this word redemption is an interesting word, because it occurs, it's a, a polytrosis, it is a word that occurs nine times in the New Testament. It means releasing, a releasing affected by the payment of a ransom. It is used nine times, always of the body of Christ. And so that's kind of an exciting thing, because Luke is focusing on the first desolation, and then he focuses on our redemption. He doesn't mention the tribulation at all, strangely enough. But then he also goes on, in a parallel fashion to Matthew, he spake to them a parable, Behold the fig tree and all the trees. Whoops, wait a minute, notice that? I think any attempts to try to identify the fig tree with Israel and so forth is misplaced because I think Luke you know, tips the apple cart over here. The idiom is simply a parable about spring foreshadowing summer. He spake to them a parable saying, Behold the fig tree and all the trees. When they now shoot forth, ye see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. It's that simple. Attempts to try to make the fig tree Israel or the, temp or the uh, city of Jerusalem or whatever, I think is, is, is uh, 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 ineffectual. In fact, if you're really tr strict on that, there's issues of what's the fig tree, what's the vine, and, and the olive tree. Those are all different things, and they're used idiomatically uh, from the parable that's in the book of Judges. But let's not go down that path today, because this is clearly uh, nullifies it, in, in my mind at least. Jesus says, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Is that the same generation that Matthew was talking about? Not sure. Let's get back. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life, so that that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come upon all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Now that's a phrase we want to be alert to. In the book of Revelation, in that book very clearly, there is a distinction between those that are saved and those that dwell on the earth. The earth dwellers in, in uh, the book of Revelation are the losers. They're the ones that get wiped out. They're the ones that uh, lose. Um, the, um, it's interesting that in the book of Revelation, the only celebration as characterized by exchange of gifts and so forth, is when the two witnesses finally die, and the earth dwellers cheer that these two troublemakers are finally off their back. And for three days they, they lay in the streets until on CNN or whatever they get resurrected. That should catch everyone's attention. But as you read the book of Revelation, you want to be sensitive to the fact that, that there are the Lord's own and the earth dwellers. You and I are not earth dwellers. We may be here, but we're pilgrims. We look for a city whose maker... Is, uh, is God. And so the earth dwellers, and I suspect that's exactly what's saying here, for as a snare it shall come up all them that dwell upon the face of the earth. If you're earth dwellers, you want to have a very light touch as we pass through here. And then verse 36, Watch ye therefore, and pray always, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. Well, wait a minute. How can they escape? these things. And if they do escape, they're going to stand before the Son of Man? What is he talking about here? Um, one of the things that we'll discover, incidentally, as we go here, in the next few verses, is that they, this didn't even occur on the Mount of Olives. Let's go on here a little bit. 
So let's take a look. Let's talk about that resolving power we talked about earlier. Remember I said if you get a cheap telescope, they all look like they're one, the same thing. And yet if you get a good telescope, spend some more money, you get better optics, you discover that what you thought was a single thing is actually a pair that overlap. And uh, so we have Luke and Matthew. And we have this strange group of signs called the beginning of sorrows that are common to both passages, except Luke talks about things that are before these things, and Matthew speaks of things after. They both talk about a desolation. I'll call Luke's desolation, desolation of Jerusalem number one. That occurred in 70 A.D. Clearly, that's what he's talking about. And that's what the preterists jump on and say, well, the whole thing is all, all fulfilled. No, not so. Because Matthew talks about a different desolation of Jerusalem, one yet to happen. And uh, Luke says of his generation that he's talking to, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. And it's interesting that 38 years from that to the fall of Jerusalem is exactly the duration of time that the generation passed away in the wilderness uh, in the scripture. And, uh, and Matthew seems to be talking about the last generation. The trick is, what's we, what, and, and I'm not suggesting the last generation is 38 years. Why? Because he says, unless those days be shortened, there should no, des- no, uh, 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 no one would be saved. No flesh would be saved. So there's a different emphasis. Let's try to look at this a little more precisely. Let's let this represent, let's just lay out Matthew 24 in front of us and Luke 21. Okay? Now, both of them talk about wars, famines, earthquakes, and so forth, the beginning of sorrows collection of signs. They also both allude subsequent to a subsequent cosmic upheaval. They both, uh, you know, climax with that. Okay. But see, Matthew, when he talks about the wars, famines, earthquakes, and so forth, says then, in other words, after these things, comes the abomination of desolation, which ushers in, in turn, the great tribulation that Jeremiah calls the time of Jacob's trouble. So far, so good. Luke talking in his uh, uh, account, he mentions the same wars, famines, earthquakes, and so forth, but says, before these things, they shall take you, and so forth. And he talks about the fall of Jerusalem that clearly happened in 70 AD with great uh, precision. Now recognize that Matthew is talking to the Jews. I suspect the Holy Spirit knew that the Jews wouldn't be reading him anyway until after those signs. They'll start taking him seriously after the abomination of desolation and following. Matthew's account will turn out to be like a handbook of survival for that generation yet to come. Luke is speaking to Gentiles, Gentile believers, and um, he highlights that, hey, when you see Jerusalem surrounded, you get out of town. But when you begin to see these things, you know, look up your redemption to off nigh. It's interesting that Luke... Um, uh, speaks of desola- what I'll call desolation number one, Matthew desolation number two. They're two separate ones, clearly uh, delineated by the cluster of signs in between them. Luke's talking about that first generation. Matthew, I think, is talking about the last generation. They're addressing two different mar- audiences. Now, this becomes very relevant when you start studying the seven letters to seven churches, because they obviously occur... Uh, after the fall of Jerusalem, because that happened in 70 A.D., and those letters were written in about 95 A.D., 20 years later. And yet still well in advance of the wars, famines, and earthquakes, and so forth, that will precede the abomination of desolation. In fact, as we look at those seven letters, we discover some interesting things. The seven letters have personal and, uh, and uh, application to us personally. It has application to all churches. But they also, among other things, profile a history of the church. That's a very, uh, sounds like a pretty wild conjecture, except it's borne out by the fact that if they were in any other order, this, what I'm going to show you, wouldn't be true. Ephesus is clearly the apostolic church, if we understand that letter, study it carefully. Smyrna is the one that is synonymous with myrrh, or death and persecution, and the whole letter is one of encouragement to Smyrna. Pergamos is the married church, where the church gets married to the world. What Satan couldn't accomplish through persecution, he accomplished by uh, having, having the church join the world. That leads to the medieval church with all its abuses. And that, of course, leads to the Reformation, which leads to what I'll call, for lack of a better term, the denominational church. You say you're alive, but you're really dead. You're in, you're in, you're in name only. And, uh, so, and, and out of that comes, of course, the, the Philadelphia church, the missionary church. And uh, the final is the apostate church, the one that uh, is uh, 
uh, thinks they're rich but are actually are destitute. Two of these letters have n uh, nothing bad said about them. Smyrna, because it's persecuted, Jesus says, everyone has a report card, some good, some bad. But Smyrna has nothing bad. Just hang in there, guys. You're doing great. And Philadelphia has nothing. They're doing great, too. There are two that have nothing good said about them. The Laodicean church has nothing good said about them. And strangely enough, the Sardis church does nothing good said about them. That's very disturbing to the Protestant denominational church. But we, we notice that the first three letters are characterized by having the promises of the overcomer subscripted. And the last four have the promises in the body of the letter. So it's a distinctive for some reason. We also discover that the last four have explicit references to the second coming of Christ. The first three don't. So the possibility, and we also know that Thyatira has promised that they're going to go into the tribulation unless they repent. So we know there's at least one church that's vulnerable to that, if not more. We know Philadelphia's promised to be raptured, in effect, if we study it carefully. And that leaves some question marks about some of the others. But all of this, in any case, is uh, prior to the wars, famines, earthquakes, and so forth. Are we together? That's a perspective. It's not necessarily correct. It's just one that we hold and we challenge you to study it carefully and come to your own conclusions. But the interesting thing about this in any case is Luke doesn't even mention the Great Tribulation. Why? I believe it's because his listeners aren't going to be in it. I think that's kind of interesting. I think that's worth paying close attention to. But there's a couple of verses I forgot to read with Luke. As you finish it, it says, In the daytime he was teaching in the temple, and at night he went out and abode in the Mount, of, uh, Mount which is called the Mount of Olives. That's interesting, because Matthew and Mark's account were on the Mount of Olives privately. Luke apparently is accounting that which Jesus told his following in the temple. He says, And all the people came early in the morning to, to him in the temple for to hear him. I think that's rather provocative. It may very well be that what Luke is summarizing is a teaching that Jesus gave under that condition, more than once probably as the days went by, but it's a summary of what he taught, in contrast to the private inside briefing that Jesus gave his disciples. They're addressing different audiences. Matthew writes to the Jew. Indeed he does. He's occupied from cover to cover with Jesus as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He starts out with the genealogy, the royal genealogy. He starts as any Jew would with Abraham, goes through Abraham to David, and uh, from David down through uh, the first surviving son of Bathsheba to Solomon, who, who was the, and then, uh, 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 and following. Um, all the way down to Joseph, the legal father of, of Jesus Christ. Luke is just the opposite. He's, a, he's, a, he's interested in Jesus as the Son of Man. He's a Gentile. He starts his genealogy in chapter 3. In effect, he starts with Adam. He takes Adam to Abraham. From Abraham to David, they're identical. But when you get to David, Luke does a very strange thing. He takes a left turn. He doesn't go through the first surviving son of Bathsheba. He goes through the second surviving son of Bathsheba, down through Heli, the father of Mary. And you have to understand, the, in addition to the fact that Mary is in the bloodline of Jesus, on top of that, you need to understand very carefully the daughters of Zelophehad in the Torah. The five the Zelophehad had five daughters. He goes to Moses to talk about inheritance. He says, I don't have any sons. Moses goes to the Lord. The Lord says, make an exception. He does. So we have this strange issue of the daughters of Zelophehad. When you get to Joshua, these five daughters come to Joshua and say, now that you're in the land, we're entitled to inherit. Check it out. Joshua does. He's, they're right, and he, they inherit. Now the point of it is, is that the, the Torah provides that if a... Uh, a, a uh, father has no sons, and she marries within the tribe, that her husband inherits what would have been hers. Um, the way that worked is the father of the bride adopted the husband as a son. That happens in Ezra and Nehemiah and several places, and that's exactly what, ha what Heli did with Joseph. So, so Joseph was a son-in-law of Heli. And that's exactly what, by the way, uh, Luke 3 says, that he's a, a son as reckoned by law, is what nomizo means in the Greek. So anyway, what I'm getting at is Matthew has a Jewish perspective. Luke has a Gentile perspective. Matthew's account, as is Mark, or Peter's account, is this private briefing on the Mount of Olives, as so delineated in both Matthew 24 and Mark 13. Luke, on the other hand, is writing to the Gentiles. 
He's very non-Jewish, in effect, in his perspective. And he apparently taught in the temple. So he's talking to a larger group, a less select group, if I may, and yet at the same time, believers. Believers that apparently survived that first desolation by following Jesus, his, his instructions. So in conclusion, in eschatology, we have this abomination of desolation. Stand in the holy place. The attempts by the preterists and others to say, well, that was fulfilled when the Roman, uh, Romans uh, uh, fell Jerusalem. There, there was a war going on. There wasn't a time to ceremonialize anything. Um, uh, in fact, the temple caught fire. It's, it's unclear how the fire started, but it was clear that Titus was really upset about it because he was hoping to get, have it as a trophy. But they can't control this fire. When it's all over, he has to instruct his troops to take the temple apart stone by stone to recover all the melted gold because the interior was wood panels uh, overlaid with gold. So all that gold melted, and it was, a, it was sufficient uh, uh, justification to tear, take it apart, which they did. But there's another issue. They, the the, the preterists like to argue that, well, the Rome, there's a record that the Romans assembled all their ensigns of the 5th, 10th, 12th, and 15th Roman legions at the eastern gate to celebrate the victory. Things burning over there, but they're celebrating. They, they, they're, they're ensigns for their various legions also operated as their idols. They, they, they did a, a, a worship of their, to, their, to their ensigns. But see, the point is... <laughs> If the predators try to make that, they say, well, that's the abomination of desolation. That's pointless because Jesus is pointing to that as something to watch for to get out of town before it gets rough. They're doing this at the end. There's no way that the Romans' worship of their ensigns is somehow the abomination of desolation. First of all, it's too late. <laughs> it's over. That's a victory celebration uh, you know, the, 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 at the climax. So it just, it just doesn't fit. It's, 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 uh, trying to, it's what they call eisegesis. You're trying to force the text to say what you're hoping. There's an expression in the computer business that keeps coming to mind when I do these studies that if you torture the data long enough, it'll confess to anything. And uh, no, the abomination of the desolation is a well-defined event in, uh, in Jewish history because of, uh, of the 167 issue. It's well-documented. You can dig into it from a number of different places, and uh, it, it's, it's well-known and still celebrated to this day through the rededication of that temple. So that's a milestone that Jesus highlights as the pivot point to understand prophecy. He points you in that passage of Matthew 24, 15, he points you to Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Once you understand that, it all, it all comes together. So I encourage you to take a serious study of the 70 weeks of Daniel and understand who Antiochus Epiphanes was. Antiochus the Great was his father. He did a lot of things that got him a, a, a place in, in Greek history. But his son was the, was the bad guy. And uh, there's also an incident I want to make sure you've heard about with Caligula. And uh, this is later. This is after the gospel period and so forth. But uh, Caligula is on an ego uh, trip, and he instructs his general in Judea. He's, in, he's, he's the emperor in Rome, but he's, he, he instructs his general in uh, Judea to place a statue of himself in the Holy of Holies. Petronius, being on the local scene, understands that if he tries to pull that off, he's going to have a repeat of what happened several centuries before, because they'll, you know, they, they, this, they'll come, they'll become, un, the, the Jews will become unglued. So he realized that that's not consistent with his mission to try to keep peace. The Romans' uh, uh, anxiety all the way through is to keep peace in the land. The thing they feared was an insurrection. They almost didn't care what you do as long as you did it peaceably. And uh, you may recall that the, the scribes and the Pharisees, when they planned to take Jesus Christ, did not plan to do it on a feast day for fear of the Romans. The reason it happened on Passover is because Jesus called the shots. At the upper room, he announces that Judas is going to betray him, and that caused, put Judas in a box. He had a fisher cut bait. So he splits to make the arrangements. He had to do it then or not do it at all. The guy controlling the time of Jesus Christ, they had not planned to do it on a feast day, certainly not the feast of Passover for crying out loud. Anyway, Caligula orders Petronius to put this, to, to reenact, in effect, the, the abomination of desolation scene from a few centuries earlier. Petronius refuses to do it. When Caligula finds out that he hasn't done it, he orders Petronius killed, understandably. He's, he, and, uh, but it happens within two weeks, Caligula dies of some, I've forgotten why now. 
Well, the message of Caligula's death gets to Judea before the message that was the edict to, to have Petronius killed. So he's off the hook. And uh, when the emperor dies, all bets are off. There's a new, new regime stepping in. So it's kind of interesting, just an incident in history, but it's interesting how God seems to intervene to prevent the abomination of desolation reoccurring until the time is right. And that time implies that there's going to be a temple in Jerusalem. There isn't today. There needs to be a temple there to be desolated. There needs to be a world leader that makes a seven-year agreement, covenant, or enforces a covenant. Maybe just he's going to enforce their right to the land, the Abrahamic covenant, whatever. But in the middle of that agreement to enforce that, he violates it and sets himself up to be worshipped. Because by then he's powerful enough to pull that off. He's on that ego trip. And we have a repeat of the whole Antiochus Epiphanes thing. If you want to know more about that, you can just study Daniel and study what Daniel says about Antiochus Epiphanes. Because clearly the passages, especially in Daniel 11, that talk about Antiochus Epiphanes, and Daniel's talking about his yet future. But as he predicts about Antiochus Epiphanes, he even sees more than that. And you, it, it, there's a, when you get to chapter 11, when you get down to about, from about uh, 35, 36 to 40, it's clearly Antiochus Epiphanes. From 40 on, it's clearly yet future. There's a blurring there. Again, there's this resolution issue. And this hiatus of the siege in 70 AD is something that's overlooked by many historians, that, that uh, because of Nero dying and the ambiguities of the throne, and Vespasian finally going to Rome to take over the empire, causes a halt, a hiatus, if you will, in the siege preparations of Jerusalem, which gave those that were informed a chance to get out of town, which they did, apparently, according to Eusebius and other records. Now, there's other implications of this, I think, that we should not overlook, and that's the deity of Christ. It's astonishing when you try to put it together to realize that Jesus predicted in Luke the details of the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And the critics have a real jam here because they like to, you know, late date things. But uh, all, the, all the technology that's being applied to scripts and the, the, the scanning laser uh, microscopes and so forth are moving the the accepted dates of the doc, New Testament documents earlier, not later. They believe they got copies of Matthew's, uh, scraps of Matthew's document that may have been aut uh, uh, autographed uh, that were like uh, 50 AD, uh, fairly er much earlier than much of your handbooks would suggest. So here we have the deity of Christ exemplified by his laying out in advance the uh, desolation of Jerusalem, enough so to get the Christians, you know, out of there. I think that in itself is an interesting apologetic. So we have some issues. We talked about the destruction of Jerusalem. There's not one. There's two of them in view. And that's pretty clear, and that resolves most of the issues. Is it 780? Yes. Is it yet future? Yes. Both are true. There's two different desolations. And the abominated desolation, what is it? I think we know very clearly if we just do our homework. When did it happen? In 167 B.C.? Is it going to happen yet? No. Jesus used that as an example of what's going to be repeated. We need to understand that. And, of course, the whole idea of the Great Tribulation. It's very provocative to deal with the Great Tribulation. One of your homework assignments is to study and come to your own conclusion as to whether or not the church goes through the Great Tribulation. I'm using the church here in the mystical sense. Not church X or church Y. I'm talking about the body of Christ. Will we go through the Tribulation? I personally believe you can clearly prove that a church will not, but I'll leave that to your own studies. That's a whole study in its own right. The parable of the fig tree, I'd be very cautious in jumping to any conclusions with the fig tree because of Luke's remark, treating the fig tree like, and all the other trees. It's simply an indication that if you see spring start, you know summer's coming. And which generation shall not pass away? Clearly, I think, Luke's comment refers to the generation that did indeed uh, 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 embrace the uh, fall of Jerusalem 70 AD. Um, now, Matthew's remark, I think, is referring to the final generation, but that's not very helpful in the sense that we don't know how, what that duration is. All we, we, it, well, there's two things we don't know. We don't know the duration, although we could stipulate, for lack of a better term, it's probably 38 years also, except what is the triggering event? That's the whole big debate. Some people felt it was the formation of the State of Israel in 1948. There's actually no scriptural reason to point to that. Others say, well, it's the, it's the Jerusalem not being trodden by the gen, down by the Gentiles. That's got two problems. It doesn't really say that exactly, but furthermore, 
it's still being trodden down by the Gentiles, in effect. The most interesting uh, conjecture is the one that I tend to lean to. I think the triggering event is the rapture. I think once the rapture takes place, God's clock for Israel starts again. It's, been, it's like a chess clock. It, it, when Jesus rode that donkey, he says, now these things are hidden from your sight. And in Romans 11.25, Paul tells you how long they're hidden, not forever. These things are hidden until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Don't confuse that with the times of Gentiles. The fullness of the Gentiles is, I believe, an idiom for the church. And I think the whole idea of the rapture is to catch Satan by surprise. To catch Satan by surprise. Because I think that's, the, that, that's, that's exactly the thrust of, of, of the, the passages we read. And uh, that's why I think it's a closely guarded secret, so to speak. But I think there's a day when the Father says to the Son, go get him. When that number is complete. And, uh, so the, and, and uh, that's when the church is completed. It was, it was born in a miracle. It will be taken out in a miracle. And that's when Israel's clock will once again start ticking. And that, that also will explain the Jewishness of the book of Revelation from chapter 6 through 19. Up till then, uh, there is no Jew or Gentile, there's Jew, Gentile in the church in Paul's idiom, idioms. And yet, uh, in Revelation from chapter 4, verse 1 on, it gets very, very Jewish. And there's some reasons for that. We serve a Jewish king. And the doctrine of eminence overlays all this stuff. It's clear the scripture teaches, and Luke emphasizes actually, that he can come at any time. So all these things, the, the generation shall not pass away, and the fig tree and so forth, has no bearing for you and me. None. Why? Because he can come tomorrow. The doctrine of eminence says, you, for in such a time as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. And the real issue here, anyway, isn't, is it, aren't these details. The issue, are you ready? That's the real issue. There is no priority in your life that is as great as dealing with, are you really ready for him? We don't want to be guilty, we, we, we don't want to be guilty like the church at Ephesus was. And they were really rigorous on doctrine. They tried those that say they're apostles or not and called them liars and so forth. They did, they did a great job in terms of doctrine. And they hated the deeds of Nicolaitan and so forth. But they blew it because they lost their first love. Jesus wants devotion, not just doctrine. Are we really spending time with him? Are we really his? Are we really living our lives with, under the expectation that perhaps today he'll come? And this issue, Dr. Emmons, is the one that pervades every one of us individually, quite apart from the theologians or the preterists or this or that, whatever. Jesus, both Matthew and Luke say, Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. So if you're pretty sure he's not coming this afternoon, <laughs> be careful. <laughs> he might. So where you, when you the, therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, Jesus says, that's an event that occurred two centuries earlier that is well known to every Jew. Every Jew that celebrates Hanukkah knows at least part of the story. And of course, Daniel hammers this. And it's an item, that, there's lots of desecration, there's lots of bad things, that, uh, outlawing the Torah, the circumcision. The issue was this idol in the holy place. That's the trigger. Now, by the way, there's a technology statement hidden here. Because the, stand in the holy place, that's in the Holy of Holies. The only people that can go in the Holy of Holies is the high priest, and only he can go in once a year after great ceremonial preparation on Yom Kippur. The Holy of Holies is sealed off with a veil, which obviously had been replaced by then and so forth. But Jesus says, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation. He's talking about people in Judea. How can people in Judea watch what's going on in this political event called the desecration of the Holy of Holies. The answer is on CNN. In other words, the event that Jesus is pointing to will be an event that everyone in Judea, maybe the whole world, can watch happen. Because of it, 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 what's taken for granted here, in, in effect, is that we will have live, uh, live video news coverage. When ye, when ye therefore shall see. And he's gonna, as you'll see in the subsequent verses, he's talking to people who are in Judea. How can, if they're in Judea, 
Watch what's going on in the Holy of Holies. It's a political event. It's, it's the same way we've been watching the, the uh, conclave issues from the new pope. We're not in Rome, but you can watch the crowds and, and the, the, you watch the first mass that he did and all that as if you were there, see? Okay, and who shall we let him understand? Here's the admonition by the Lord for you to study this so you really understand it. But then when you see that, what does he say to do? Let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Not in Paris, Rome, or London, or or Los Angeles. No, them which be in Judea. It's a local issue. Let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. And when he says split, he means now. Let Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. They need to understand how the architecture is in that part of the country. Most Most houses are on a hillside. And the roof is sort of like a garden. That's a, that, you, you may not have a lot of land, but you've got the roof. So that's where you entertained. That's where you had the weekend barbecue. It was on the roof. So typically, if you're entertaining or casual, you're home casually, you're on the housetop. It's, that was designed for that. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. You split. You split now. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. He's out there in work clothes. If he somehow gets wind of what's going on here, he heads out now. Woe unto them that are with child and them that give suck in those days. And pray that your flight be not in the winter. Why? Because often Judea is not passable in the winter. It snows. But then you have this revealing little remark, neither on the Sabbath day. That tells you something. To whom is Jesus talking? To people who are in Judea. Right. Right. What kind of people are they? Jews. The Jewish. Matthew wrote to the Jews. Matthew is a Levi. The whole gospel is very, very Jewish. His whole occupation is presenting Jesus Christ as the lion of the tribe of Judah, etc. So you need to understand the Jewishness of Matthew in the first place, and this is very consistent with that. Pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. If you're a Christian, you don't care. If you're a Jew, you care. You've got constraints. The Sabbath day. Inter- very key point. We'll come back to that later. And then why, why are you r- getting out of there with such urgency? He explains in verse 21, For then shall be great tribulation. There's that term from which we get the label for that period of time, the great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time nor ever shall be. That's a wild statement. How much evil, how much oppression has there been in the world? A bunch. If you just looked at what Antiochus Epiphanes was doing, that's bad enough. You look at the Nazi Holocaust, etc., etc. Jesus is saying there is a time coming that will be the worst it's ever been to that time or ever would be again. The Holocaust in Europe took one, they estimate, took one Jew out of three out of Europe. One in three. Zechariah chapter 13, verse 8 and 9 indicates that the next one is going to take two out of three. I didn't say that. Zechariah did. Chapter 13, verse 8 and 9. In fact, Jesus goes on to point out here in verse 22, except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. By the way, that's another one of these technology statements. If you and I were studying this, say, during the 1860s, during the Civil War period, we'd have a hard time visualizing this. We can't visualize the world wiping itself out with muskets and bayonets. But that cloud overhangs every geopolitical decision on the planet Earth today. There's enough in inventory many times over to wipe out the entire planet. Except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. Ah, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Jesus is, in effect, quoting from Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12 opens up, At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. There you have his job description. We know what Gabriel is. Gabriel is an annunciator. He's always announcing something having to do with the Messiah, whether it's to Mary or to Daniel or wherever. Michael is a military commander. He's the great prince that standeth for the children of Israel. 
And, then, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book, and so forth. Same, same, same concept there is that uh, uh, we have an echo in the, in, in the uh, Olivet Discourse. This same period of time is commented on by Jeremiah. He gives it another label. So the last for the day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. The great tribulation is the t label that we use from the New Testament, because of Jesus' remark. The Old Testament equivalent phrase is the time of Jacob's trouble. The re it's worldwide, but the focus is Israel, or Jacob. The time of Jacob's trouble. Then Jesus continues, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here he is Christ, or there, believe it not, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Boy. You know, we're not ready for that. We're not ready to see political leaders raise people from the dead. Or whatever. We're not used to seeing miracles. We always assume if it's a miracle, it must be of God. Not necessarily so. There are things called lying wonders, and it's going to be very prevalent among the, the, the leadership that's coming. And Jesus said, Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. That's a phrase that scholars still scratch their head. What could that mean? Um, the word carcass is the same word as would be used for a body. The eagles are not carrions. Eagles are not like vultures. Some people try to say, well, gee, that word, that the term may be covering both. They wrestle with this. It may mean as simply this, that where Christ is, that's where we will be with him. But uh, that's, uh, there's, there, there's not good uh, scholastic agreement on, on how to apply that verse. So I'll leave that to you for your own thought. But immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the... Again, notice each step in, Master's, in, in uh, Matthew's account, it's then and then and then. Everything is later, 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 later. So you hear, after the, after the abomination of desolation, then we have the tribulation. Then after the tribulation, after, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heavens shall be shaken. You know, there are people that try to say all this has happened back in 70 A.D. What do they do with verse 29 and 30? They got a couple of problems. First of all, I don't know that the sun was dark and the moon didn't give her light and the stars fell from him, the powers of heavens being shaken. I'm not so you'd notice. <laughs> but then the next verse is even tougher. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, for they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That's one problem the preterists have if they're going to try to say this is all fulfilled back a long time ago. Because they have to allegorize all of this. They have to somehow shine it on and uh, it's very, it's not easy immediately after the tribulation now those of you that studied daniel know about the 70th week the 70 weeks of daniel that gabriel gave daniel how 69 were fulfilled to the very day fulfilled when jesus presents himself as the mashiach nagi the messiah the king and how the last of the 70 weeks is still to take off there's a, we are in that interval in that interval gabriel tells daniel the messiah will be executed that's mentioned in the Old Testament, it's predicted that he would be executed, and that the city and the sanctuary would be destroyed. And indeed they were. That interval is at least 38 years. We've, exper we've experienced that it's you know, virtually 2,000. So. But what we're looking for, what's coming, is a last week of years to fulfill the 70-week prophecy of Daniel. All this is out of Daniel 9. And that last week of years is a literal week of, uh, of uh, actually six years and 11 months. And it's defined by a covenant being enforced. It's not defined by the rapture or any of these other things. It's defined by a covenant being enforced by a world leader uh, up on Israel. In the middle of that week, he, as, uh, he uh, establishes the abomination of desolation once again, just as was done by Antiochus Epiphanes. It's interesting that the records seem to indicate that Antiochus Epiphanes, when he entered Jerusalem, did it under subterfuge. Under false pretenses, he violated his apparent agreement and took it over and uh, even took the, the people that were welcoming him and uh, had them um, dealt with. 
But the abomination of desolation defines the middle of that week, and the, it's the period from the middle of that week to the end that is defined by none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself as what we call the Great Tribulation. And it's a three-and-a-half-year period, not seven, but most people speak of the seven years collectively as a, as, as a tribulation period. That's a, a, in a casual sense. And it is concluded by the Battle of Armageddon and all of that and the second coming of Christ and the establishment of the millennium on the planet Earth, if you take the text seriously. Now, there are different views about the tribulation. The post-tribulationists figure that somehow at the end here is when the, the, the believers are caught up, which is a little awkward because when he comes back, at the second coming, he comes back with the, with the saints. And between them being gathered and coming back, there's the marriage supper of the Lamb. And as one person quipped, he says, the post-tribulational view makes the marriage supper of the Lamb a snack lunch. Because you 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 go up and you come right back down. And he's of course being just kidding a little bit. But um, there are those, and we uh, we tend to align with those that, that are pre-tribulationists. That is, we believe that the gathering of God's of uh, uh, those that, that are in Christ will be prior to this whole period. And we won't burden this briefing trying to try to justify that position. There's lots of reasons we hold that view. Um, but uh, the uh, there are those that correctly point out that the wrath, that, that are pre-wrath, that is, that the, the church is gathered before the, the wrath of God, but the wrath of God is that last three and a half weeks. So they, we, some people call them mid-tribulationists. Both the mid- and post-tribulational uh, viewpoints suffer from a problem called uh, they violate the doctrine of eminence. If post-trib and mid-trip were correct, then Jesus can't come back today. Because there's a whole bunch of events that have to occur prior to that time. And if you're going to assume that the doctor of eminence is correct, then that means there's nothing that need intervene. That, that Jesus could come back for us all this afternoon, tomorrow morning, whenever. That's what they call the doctrine of eminence, and both mid- and post-tribulation views have a problem with that. That's not the only reason. That's one of the reasons we cling to a pre-trib position. I'll point out something else. When people make charts, they often forget this. There's an indeterminate period of time between the gathering of the saints and the beginning of that seventh week. Why? Because the seventh week is defined by a world leader making a, enforcing a covenant with Israel. In order to enforce that covenant, he has to be in power. In order to be in power, he must have been revealed publicly, and before he can be revealed publicly, the rapture takes place. So there's an interval. It might be an hour. It might be a day. It might be several years. We don't know. But the... the, the, the Rapture does not trigger the 70th week. It's some, some, time, some indeterminate time prior, apparently, if we understand it correctly. Then Matthew continues, Then shall he send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds and from one end of heaven to the other. Well, I, gee, I thought they were raptured. No, there's a whole bunch of people, hopefully. In fact, there, there's going to be incredible um, fruitfulness of the 144,000 two witnesses, there's all kinds of things that occur after the rapture that uh, cause people to get saved. And that's what's being gathered here. Now learn, that, and, this, and some people call them the tribulation saints. There's people that have come to faith during the tribulation. And, uh, but then we have this interesting enigmatic parable. Now learn the parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled. There have been acres of books published trying to speculate from these factors uh, what it means time-wise. There are many people that try to make the fig tree an idiom of Israel. And that there are, way, there are occasions when that might be justified, but there's also, you'll discover, that's not consistent. And you'll also discover that the, Israel is generally figured as the vine in Isaiah f, uh, 5 and elsewhere. And so people who try to make that or uh, have a tough time selling it. And then the question is, how long is a generation? It's pretty easy to justify 38 years as a generation because that was what a generation was defined as uh, in Deuteronomy. Uh, with uh, the wandering in the wilderness, we say is 40 years. That's round numbers. It was precisely 38 years. And it was also 38 years between uh, the, these, these discourses and the uh, temple being uh, torn down. So, but what, is, what triggers this? And we'll come back to that in a little bit. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, of heaven but my Father only. A familiar passage, but what's even more remarkable is the way Mark records it. Mark goes one step further. 
the equivalent place in Mark, he says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, neither the Son, but the Father only. Do you mean to say, at least at that time, there was something that the Father knew that the Son did not? That sort of shatters our understanding, because at the upper room, we got the impression that I and the, I and the Father are one. And so I'm not here to unravel that, just to highlight the fact that at least at this moment, there was something that the Father had in his own counsel. And I think there's some reasons he did that it was very, very closely held. We'll come back to that. Then Matthew goes on, But as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the sin of man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Most scholars assume that all this is trying to get across is that it was business as usual until uh, the, the, the uh, uh, coming of the Son of Man occurs. And that's justifiable. There are many scholars, however, that suspect there's more into this than just the, that. It's more than that. To really understand this idiom, you need to understand what was the cause of the days of Noah. And we're not going to get into that here except to highlight, to really understand this, you need to get into Genesis 6 and understand why God sent the flood in the first place. And that gets into the whole issue of the uh, ha Elohim and the Nephilim and all of that. And so there may be far more lurking behind this passage than most people re uh, sense on first reading. But then Matthew goes on, but then shall be two in the field, one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, one shall be taken, and the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. The, in the uh, other, in the Mark account, he mentions that two men will be sleeping in the same bed, one will be taken, the other left. What's interesting about the passage is that it's also a technology statement. Because you've got people in the, the women grinding at the mill did the first thing in the morning. They ground the, the meal for the day. Two men in the field was during the day. Two men sleeping would be at night. So you got morning, noon, and night at the same instant. It's a t testimony to a round earth, if you will. And uh, uh, people have different views in this, but I suspect that he's gathering his people. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. That's in the King James English, but it's misleading because the good man sounds like a good guy. Not necessarily. The word is, really means a master or just the head of the house. Know that if the, if the head of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, who's coming in the thief, like a thief in the night? Jesus is. So who's the good man of the house? Who is the God of this world? See, the good man is having, he's suffering his house to be broken up. See, I believe the idiom here is Satan himself. Know that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. I think the idea here is, is that the thief that's coming in the night is our Lord. And he's, he, it's his way of saying that um, uh, for such time as you think not, He's going, to, he's going to catch you. Be careful he doesn't catch you by surprise. But in this case, see, it's the house that's being broken up. But then he goes on. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But if, but and if, that evil servant shall say in his heart, The Lord delayeth his coming. He shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder and appoint his portion with the hypocrites, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So that's the Matthew account. In our next session, we'll examine Luke and show some surprises between the two that will raise more questions than we even started with. But it'll be rewarding. Stay with us. Well, in the second session, we'll now examine the Olivet Discourse as recorded by Luke. We read it superficially through once last time, in the last session. Let's take a look at it a little more closely. 
As some spoke of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts, he said, As for these signs, as for these things which ye behold, the days will come in, in the which there shall not be left one stone upon another, shall not be thrown down. And they asked him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be? And what sign shall there be when these things shall come to pass? So far, so good. Very parallel to the Matthew account, it would seem. And he said, Take heed that ye be not deceived. There again we have that admonition that's epistemological, of how do you keep from being deceived? For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them. But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. So, so far we're quite comfortable. It seems to track the Matthew account very closely. And then he gets to this group of signs. Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and, there, and great earthquakes shall be in divers places, and famines and pestilences, and fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. So far, so good. But then we get, and are we ready? Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Well, Father, we thank you that in your kingdom there are no accidents, there's no coincidences, that we're all here right now by your divine appointment. And we do pray, Father, that through your Holy Spirit, you will accomplish your purpose in each of our lives. Wake us up, Father, that we might be sensitive to the times, that we might recognize that there are things that you would have us do in the days that remain. Father, we do come before you acknowledging our sins, which are many, especially sins of ingratitude and presumption and how, how far we've fallen. And yet, Father, we thank you that you are a gracious God and that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We do pray, Father, you would cleanse us from that unrighteousness and that you would reignite in each of us a new hunger, a new passion for your word that we each might be more fruitful stewards of the opportunities that you've placed before us as we commit ourselves right now into your hands, in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Here he would defend that very thoroughly. He's a good friend. And it's, if that's the only place I know that Hal and I have a friendly disagreement. Um, there are others, um, I assume Grant Jeffrey, but certainly Chuck Smith, and there's a handful of us that believe that the Gog Magog thing happens prior to the whole 70th week of Daniel. And, uh, and we may not be right, but that's just, we have a number of reasons for ho what we all agree on, though, by the way. Here's the exciting part. Even though we have different views as to exactly where it fits in the timeline, we all agree doesn't mean we're right either. We could be wrong about this, but we at least all agree that the Magog e event of Ezekiel 38 and 39 happens after the rapture of the church. After the rapture. After the rapture. And the reason we, there's several reasons, but one of which is that in Ezekiel 38, God is overtly dealing with Israel directly. Which impl and, and if you, uh, most, those of us that have this view that I'm suggesting believe there's a distinctiveness between Israel and the church. Yeah, the, the 69 that, weeks. Yes. Uh, then there's then that the interval. Up the final verse 20, week. Yes, verse 26 is between 25 and 27. It's an interval. It lasts about 2,000 years. That is the church period. And then it's the 70th week yes. of Daniel. And, and exactly. where, where do you feel the Middle East peace process comes in that, Chuck? I think that's just turbulence. There'll, there'll be no peace until the Prince of Peace comes. And, because, I, because and, and, and no matter how hard we try, we can send Condoleezza Rice there all you like, it's not going to be, and, and she finally has to throw up her hands, yeah. there's not going to be a, a legacy for Bush to leave yeah. on because it's, no, right. it's a matter. It, but, but a lot of people do think that there's, uh, the treaty has to be signed with the Middle East Peace no, Treaty before the Antichrist. Be careful, 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 careful. <laughs> no, I'm there's saying no what, what There is no peace treaty saying. being signed necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's a mistranslation by many. What the text says that this leader, this world leader, is going to enforce a covenant. Now, he may indeed, he apparently does, enter into a, a relationship right. for seven years, and in the middle of that, he violates it. No Correct. question about it. But the covenant, he might be, might be the Palestinian covenant, giving them the right to the land and a right yes. to rebuild. That's, that's a speculation. We yes. don't know. 
exactly the terms of that. We do know that when he violates that covenant, it causes the sacrifice and the oblations to cease, which means they will have started. That means there will be a era of what I'll call a false peace precedent to that. In fact, the first... With the third temple. Yes, exactly. And the, uh, understand that the, tribula the Great Tribulation is not seven years long. Mm -hmm. It's three and a half. People use that term, what they really should mean. And by the way, you're listening, one thing you want to advocate, if you're going to get into this, develop a discipline to be very precise in your definitions. A, a sloppy definition here or there leads to all kinds of misunderstandings. So there's the Great Tribulation, and exactly. there's the Tribulation. We're promised Tribulation, small t. If we're in Christ, we know that we're going to be persecuted. We're Today. Going to be, yes. <laughs> and, and in America, it's going to get worse and worse. For a biblical Christian, that's a whole other subject we can get into. It's going to get worse and worse. But the point is, the Great Tribulation is the last three and a half years, and Jesus himself labels it as such in Matthew 25, uh, uh, 24, verse 15. The, uh, 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 and he's just quoting Daniel 12 when he does that. But the point is, um, that last three and a half years will be a, is a very distinctive period worthy it, of very a, careful study. Is there an event that triggers it off as the yes, Great the Abomination of Desolation. Okay, and what do you think that is, Chuck? I think it's, ex uh, well, when Jesus... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's Chuck just answering his phone. Chuck's answering his phone. I apologize. <laughs> that was my wife. Just landed safely in Charlotte. Oh, okay. I'll be glad. And yeah, I'll be glad I, to I meant to turn that off when we were on the air. I should have turned that off, and I'll do so right now. Now, listen, yeah. while Brother Chuck does that, let me just say, Saints. Yeah. Chuck, where did we leave off on the Christian? You were asking about, about the abomination of desolation. Yes, yes, yes. That is a term that we know a lot about because it happened historically in 167 B.C. And Jesus, when he makes that remark to his disciples, re is referring to a historical event three centuries earlier. And so we know what he's referring to because there's a historical precedent. And what was that precedent? The establishment of an idol. Uh, the word abomination means idol worship in the, in the Bible. The abomination of desolation is the ultimate, the most insulting, extreme form of idol worship. What is that? Putting an idol in the most holy place on the planet Earth, which is in the Jerusalem, in the temple, in the ho holy place? No, no, in the holy of holies. In and that's, ex that's exactly what happened back in 167 B.C., uh, that led to the, uh, you know, the whole, uh, you know, uh, Hasmonean uh, revolt and so on. But Jesus is using that as an idiom of something yet future. And so we know that there's going to be another world leader, just like Antiochus Epiphanes was back then, that is going to, among other things... Can I ask you something, sure. Chuck? Was it, how do we know that he wasn't the Antichrist? Who? Epiphanes, that... He was. But a form I mean, of, but form yes. Of, but, but yes, sure. I know, form sure. of. But a lot, some people think that he, that he was, and, and that Titus they were was talking a about of his that. Too, by the way, there's a yes. whole line, by the way. But but um, so so he certainly was a foreshadowing, if you will, of the. Now, the, you know, you, we use the term Antichrist, and I'm not going to fight that battle. Except there are 33 titles in the Old Testament and 13 in the New, and that son ain't of, one of them. Son of perdition. John uses that phrase in his letters. Yes. John wrote Revelation, did not use it in Revelation. Yes. Now, we have adopted that to label this guy, and so I'm not going to... Just understand that it's a, it, the word antichristos means in the place of. What? He's anti, he's against Christ, but what the word really is in the place of. But uh, this world leader, the sequence is, he can't surface until after the rapture. Second Thessalonians 2 makes that clear if you exegete it carefully. And uh, so he... Rapture takes place... This world leader is revealed, then gets powerful enough to enforce this covenant. That might be one day or 30 years. We have no idea how long that interval is, but there is an interval. When he enforces that covenant, that triggers the 70th week of Daniel. That's what defines it. The temple doesn't define it. The harpazo, the rapture doesn't define it. It's that, it's that enforcement does. Then in the middle of that treaty period, or enforcement period, he violates that by setting himself up to be worshipped. And that triggers... A, a whole sequence of commands that Jesus gave us in Matthew 24. So I, I don't know if that responds to your question. Right, question. Yeah, okay. It does okay. But it, yeah, let's yeah. also just back up in the sense that the fig tree. Yes. Representing Israel. Well, now let's be careful. Okay. Let's be careful. We we're, we're, we're talking. If you've just joined us, this is Chuck Precision Missler. Well, 
and he's right here making sure that we're all precise. And, there and is that, a misconception within. I wanted the, to get onto the generation. I wanted the, to get onto the generation. Yes, yes, I know you do. That's, That's why, why I wanted I'm to get to. I'm trying to hedge you off. Because you said head. something about the war, 30 I want, years. I, I, I want to let, just uh, bear with me. There is a fallacy, an assumption. We always get in trouble with our presuppositions. Okay. Even my early materials say the same thing that Matthew 20, the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. Wrong. Mark, uh, Matthew 24, Mark 13 is an inside briefing to four disciples at night on the Mount of Olives. Very, very well known, very key passage. Luke 21 is a presentation by Jesus Christ to a different audience in the temple during the day. Okay. We, we, the first point to understand is don't mix those two up. Okay. They're very similar, but they're different focus, different. And you need to unpack this a little bit more. Well, that's why I'm, I'm getting at this, because okay. many, many people that are, are getting confused by the preterists, people who have strange views, because we are all guilty of having put those all together, and when you do, they're, they're, they lend to a huge misunderstanding. Okay? Which is? Which is they're separate. Jesus Christ, in the temple was addressing his believers that was in front of him, and he warned them that when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, get out of town, don't let your friends come back. And he, 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 by following his advice, they saved their lives. Which was the Roman army that came up. Yes, but here's the point that many people miss, is that the Roman army, uh, Titus, Titus and his father Vespasian had, had uh, successfully subdued northern uh, Judea and so forth. They were ordered by Nero to t solve the Jerusalem problem and they were getting ready to when Nero dies. All bets are off. So Vespasian, after a lot of turbulence in Rome, after some months, he goes and takes over the empire. Okay. He's now Caesar, right? He tells his son, finish the job. There were nine months while the armies were around Jerusalem but they hadn't sealed it off yet. Okay. Jesus is telling his believers when in you Luke. Huh? It's in Luke, Luke 21. 21. When you see that, get out of town. And they did, by the way. Okay. We have from the writings of Eusebius, one of the early church fathers, he says that, the, that see, when Jerusalem fell in 70 AD, over a million and a half men, women, and children were slaughtered by the Romans. Not one Christian, according to Eusebius. Because they all obeyed Christ. They all the went east of the Jordan River into a different jurisdiction under Syria called Pella. Okay, but how does that relate to people misinterpreting that for today? Because when Jesus says to them in, Rev in Luke 21, this generation shall not pass till all this be fulfilled, 38 years from the time he said that, Jerusalem is destroyed. The same dur duration that the generation wandered in the wilderness mm -hmm. for 38 years. Okay. Get the impact. Got it. In Luke, the figure, when you, first see, when you start seeing these things, you know the end is near. And everybody will ha try, the trick is, okay, what's the trigger point? You know, is it the state of Israel? Some people say so, but that didn't work. And, you know, there's all kinds of conjectures. I'll come back to that. When you get to the Olivet Discourse, four disciples, Peter, James, and John, the inside three, and Andrew, Peter's brother, are getting an inside briefing on the end times. Different generation. When he says that to, in the Matthew presentation, he's talking about that final generation on the planet Earth. Don't get those two generations mixed up. Okay, okay. Gotcha. The one had their life saved by two things. By Christ's presentation in, in Luke 21, and, by the way, Paul's letter to the Hebrews. By following his instructions, they saved their life, and they did. And that's also a matter of record. In the Matthew case... Jesus is giving them an inside briefing on the very end times. That's where we get this whole issue about the uh, uh, abomination of desolation from verse 15 on. Correct. What confuses everybody is there are elements of the two presentations that are sim similar. There's a cluster of signs. In fact, they're non-signs. Nation against nation, uh, kingdom against kingdom. All these are the beginning of birth pangs, Matthew says. Correct. That collection of idioms... Jesus uses in the Luke 21 presentation. But notice something. In Luke 21 at verse 12, um, it's, Jesus, after he says about the nation, you know, use those signs, the next verse 12 says, but before these things, and then he goes on to what, re, what we now recognize as that first 
uh, desolation of Jerusalem back in 70 AD. Gotcha. In the Matthew account, that same collection of signs, after the, then, then when you shall see the abomination, see now he's talking about the end time. The, end time, the second des desolation, the one that's yet future, the one that is going to be climax with Armageddon and the, and the Lord interrupting uh, the, the, that whole scene. Okay, do you believe we're in those times, Chuck Missler? I think we're close. I know we're not in those times because... You know, this gets yeah, to how, how do you know? Why? Because, because of the doctrine of eminence. Because mm -hmm. Jesus told us to expect him at any moment. And, and there's passage after passage after passage that leads us to what collectively is called the doctrine of eminence. That Jesus Christ can come for us before this program is over. Maybe so you tomorrow. don't believe there's anything stopping Jesus Absolutely, coming? Absolutely, there's no that's preceding that's condition yep. for his gathering his own, the body in Christ. That's what Paul talks about in 1 Thessalonians 4 and, and in 1 Corinthians 15 and so on. Now, that's not true of his second coming. His second coming can't happen tomorrow because there are a series of events that expressly precede a second coming. The seven years that we call the seventh week in Daniel hasn't started yet. Uh, Donald Gray Barnhouse used to, uh, had a friend of mine by the name of Walter Martin who studied under Donald Gray Barnhouse. And Walter used to admit, even though Walter had some strange ideas, he said, well, Donald Gray Barnhouse used to come to the office every day and say, sad day, sad day, Jesus can't come back today. And that was his way of needling Walter because Walter was post-trib in his <laughs> viewpoint. And the, the point is, there are all kinds of conditions. In fact, in the Old Testament, Hosea chapter 5, verse 15, God speaking through Hosea, I will return to my place. Now, wait a minute. That means he must have left it. I will return to my place until they acknowledge their offense. That's singular and specific. In their affliction, they will seek me earnestly. Which is the tribulation. Exactly. And it also explains what the purpose of the tribulation is. It's gonna, it, that there's a prerequisite condition to the second coming of Christ. There is no prerequisite condition to the rapture. That'll happen anytime. Okay. Not this, even the fact that the Lord encourages us, this gospel has to be preached to the out of the ends of the earth, and then the end will come. One can argue that it has been, but the preachment has, but is an is a, a angel in Revelation 10 going through the heavens. So that's not a precondition to the harpazo. Okay. You can call if you want to. You can look at it as a precondition to the second coming. All right. So are you okay. saying the second uh, the, that the rapture could have happened a hundred years ago? No, I, no, it didn't. If, no, no, by no. The way, if it had, <laughs> if it had, some of us wouldn't be in the kingdom. No, yeah. yeah. But are you saying it could have with no preconditions Absolutely. on it? Absolutely. Okay. Very interesting. Uh, what is the fig tree check? What's the, the fig tree, tree is an indication that what you, that you will sense you're going to be you're not going to get caught by surprise so yes, that exactly. when you see the. It, it, it's in, a sign. Yes, yes. And, and incidentally, in the Luke account, yep. it's the fig tree and the other trees. It's in it's when you, you can tell wh for the first signs of spring that summer's coming. Okay. That's the point. And, and so we should have an expectation. Paul, Paul says the same thing in 1 Thessalonians 5. We all read 1 Thessalonians 4, 5. You're not, he comes as a thief in the night to the children of the night. But you are of the day, not the night, that that should overtake you as a thief. The Christian will not be surprised. So we as Christians, basically, when we see the extraordinary rebirthing of the state of Israel in 48, yep. that, is, that is likened to the fig tree coming yes. in. But, I don't, I, but where you fall in the traps is say, gee, uh, uh, generation is 38 years or whatever, and therefore in 1988 that came and went. You know? So my point is, don't set dates. That's, you know, we're, we're instructed not to do that. There's a temptation to do that. No, we know it's near. People ask me, uh, uh, you know, do I think uh, the Antichrist is alive today? Absolutely. Absolutely. What makes you think that? Because a hundred years ago, if you asked me the same question, I'd say the same thing. Because, see, Satan's got a problem. He's got to have his man in the wings. Because the trigger is the harpazo. And the reason the harpazo is the rapture is not exp express in the scriptures, I believe, this conjecture on my part, is to catch Satan by surprise. Because when um, the, the day will come, when the father says to the son, go get him, and he'll gather his own. At that point, Satan, that's, that's a starting gun. And he knows that whatever he's going to do, he's got a small window to pull it off. So he's had to have somebody in the wings all along. Is the Antichrist alive today? Absolutely. Now, I have a lot of other reasons to, re to believe he's alive today. But I also know from the scripture that it's a waste of time to try to second guess who he is. Because he won't be revealed until after the harpazo. 
So, so just to clarify, yeah. the rapture taking place doesn't automatically start the seven-year clock. Ex exactly right. There's an interval between... You think it could be seven years, it could be 30 years, it, it could, could be... be... It could be a day, or it could be many years, who knows, because the interval from the time... After Atatsu, he's revealed, right. and he has to come to power to enforce that covenant. Okay, and that, at that point, the covenant comes into play, and then the seven that, years, that, the final week of Daniel. That defines the, that defines the seventieth week, that final week of the of Gabriel's vision to Daniel, Daniel chapter nine. Well, and your listeners, the thing they should do, don't take my word for any of this, because Acts seventeen eleven applies. Receive the word with openness, openness of mind, but search the Scripture to prove whether those should be so. But if you're serious about prophecy. You need to master the last four verses of Daniel 9. Jesus pointed his disciples to that. And if you study that carefully, and you have that laid out, everything else falls into place. Yeah. If you're muddled up on that, for, there are a lot of books being written on prophecy where the author clearly doesn't have that clear... You and know, therefore he could be struggling. And it fumbles up everything else, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we're talking to Chuck Precise, Miss Lewis. <laughs> oh, so, you know what's so wonderful, him. I have to say, and you knew my dad. Chuck is very, very, it reminds Fantastic. me of my father. My dad used to hate ignorance and sit me down since I was little and make sure it was all right. So, well, good for you we, we, got, we, we, we have a lot more, and the good news is we've got Chuck for at least another couple of programs, another couple of weeks, depending on when you're watching this. We've run out of time on this program. The next program, Wendy, we're going to be picking up on the whole alien agenda, we and are, we'll spend the full program indeed. on that. Yes, we are. So Chuck, we thanks for being thanks with us. Thanks so much. It's and a I'm, delight. I'm it's sure delight. Chuck has given everyone watching a great deal to think about, but we'll be back with him next week with more on end time subjects, and especially the subject of UFOs, aliens, yeah. and how they may relate to the end times. And what's exciting is, you know Chuck by now is so precise.